Well, we're going to continue on in our study in 2 Peter, chapter 1. And uh, in your bulletins, uh, you will find the scripture on the back page of your bulletin. I thought it turned on. Yes, go. I can use the other mic if you have to. One, two. Yes? Just use the right this way. Let's go back to low tech. Oh, I can't see my notes. <laughs> You have in your bulletins the scripture that we're going to be looking at today from 2 Peter, uh, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1 and verses 17 through 22 of chapter 2. We will obviously won't be looking at all of those verses, but they're related. And for the message this morning, I wanted to have both of them before you. Uh, let's just read them. I'll read them. You can follow along. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. These are springs without water, mist driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves to corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Father, as we look into your word this morning, we ask that you would guide us by the Spirit uh, open our hearts to your truth. We know that we have to have uh, eyes that are opened by you. And Father, even as I preach uh, from your word, there must be more than just me involved. It has to be you by your spirit doing what only you can do in our hearts and minds. And we're trusting you for that today. Father, we acknowledge that we have an enemy. We know that he is around. We know that there are demonic powers who are resisting you and the ministry of the gospel and we stand against them this morning in the name of jesus christ just grant to us your freedom and your blessing we pray in jesus name amen phil calvary uh, you probably all know Phil Calvary, at least know of him, said this, 
uh, one sleepy Sunday afternoon, when my son was about five years old, we were driving past the cemetery together, noticing a large pile of dirt beside a newly excavated grave. Uh, my son pointed and said, look dad, one got out. <laughs> I laughed, he says, but now every time I pass the graveyard, I'm reminded of the one who got out. I have a burden that I want to share with you. And I've been carrying this for a number of years. I believe that we have a lot of God's people who are still encumbered by their past, who need to actually be released. They need the freedom that Christ has to offer to them. We all have our struggles, and I understand that. And we all are in a growth process, and I understand that. But the thing that we're going to be looking at today from the scripture before us is the fact that until we are released from our past, there is no growth. And I think that Peter makes that very, very clear in this portion of scripture before us. Remember from last week that I mentioned to you that the theme of the book of 2 Peter is the theme of growth. Uh, he mentions that we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's in the last chapter, the last verse of the book. In chapter 1, verse 2, uh, we read these words that we need to uh, grow, uh, that grace and peace, I should say, need to be multiplied. And in verse 8, which you don't have before you in the bulletin, but in verse 8, he talks about these qualities being ours and increasing. So growth is a real key theme or real key uh, aspect of the letter that Peter is writing. Now there are a number of observations that we can make about growth from this portion. First of all, growth is for those who receive faith in verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Christ Jesus, to those who have received the faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, faith, he says in verse 2, is referred to as a knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You find that in chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, you find that in verse 3 where he says, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness to the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Uh, you find that same thing repeated in chapter 2, verse 29, uh, which says, that's not verse 29. Anyway, it talks about this knowledge as well, this knowledge. And this knowledge is synonymous with faith. And that knowledge is not simply a head knowledge. Uh, it's, a, it's a thorough knowledge. Uh, it's a knowledge of head and heart. Uh, it's a knowledge of commitment that he's talking about. So uh, that is the beginning of growth. Uh, it is the imparting of faith. And that faith is a gift from God. It's a gift of divine power. Notice in verse 3, he says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and grace. So uh, this faith is a gift of divine power. Now, he says that this gift is given to us in verse 2. Um, I'm having trouble reading here. I'll have to look at my bigger print on this page. Uh, verse 3, he says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So it's, it's granted to us. And then if you look at verse 4, he says, For by these things he has granted to us, his precious and magnificent promises, so that, that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Now this word granted uh, is referring, I believe, back to the faith that we have received. It's been given to us by God. But that word granted is uh, a very interesting word, the tense that is used. That tense that is used is a perfect tense in the Greek. 
And basically what it is is this. Uh, it is a completed action in past time which has ongoing and permanent results. That's the idea in the word. It's the perfect tense. Uh, you've probably heard the statement used sometimes uh, when somebody's questioning you on an issue and you just make the statement, statement but it's a given. Uh, that's a statement that has been used during the pandemic quite often. Uh, when anyone has uh, questioned the uh, science that has gone into the decision making and anyone had, who had the audacity, audacity to question the science was uh, rebuttaled with a simple statement, it's a given. The science is settled. Well, this word here is a given. Uh, that's the sense in that word. The, the science is settled on this whole issue. Uh, this is a permanent, lasting gift that God gives to us. This gift of faith. Now, faith is a gift of divine power. You see that in verse 3, seeing that by his divine power he has granted to us everything. Now, the, the grace that he speaks of in verse 2 and the life that he speaks of in verse 3 are identical. So if you took and drew a circle around grace and around life and put a line between, between verses 2 and 3, you would get the idea. If you draw a circle around peace in verse 2 and you put a line to godliness in verse 3, you have the picture. So faith is a gift of divine power. Uh, it consists of grace and of life, and it consists of peace and godliness. I was thinking about that issue of peace. I meant to mention it the last time I spoke, but I, I kind of passed over it. I think it's very, very significant in this portion that uh, Peter uses the word peace because peace is the idea of binding together. Uh, the idea in peace is taking all of the parts that make the thing whole and putting them all back together in the right order. Uh, it would be very similar, I believe, to the word shalom in Hebrew, which is wishing a wish for wholeness or completeness. And so what Peter is doing here is he's saying that we uh, are to be growing or multiplying in peace, this whole idea of the peace is coming back together, making the object whole, and that peace is the godliness that he's talking about. And that godliness is seen in this entire portion. Uh, we don't have it written here, but there are seven items uh, from verses 5 through 7, seven items that need to be supplied in our faith. And those seven items would define the godliness that Peter is speaking about here. So the peace and the godliness are the same thing. Uh, all of these attributes that he's talking about that need to be supplied in our faith would define the word peace. It's the wholeness that God wants his people to have. And then faith is... I think uh, these growth areas uh, are exactly the opposite of the corruption that Peter is talking about in this portion. You notice in verse 4 he says, we are partakers of the divine nature, that's the faith that he's talking about. The faith is given to us by divine power. As we exercise that faith, we participate in the divine nature. There is a rebirth that takes place, a new birth that takes place, and this new birth then uh, enables us to escape from the corruption that is in the world. And all of these attributes that he speaks of are the exact opposite of the corruption that is in the world. They're moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Those are the growth areas. Uh, that's where the grace and peace need to be multiplied and in those particular areas they need to be added to our lives. And they are the exact opposite of the corruption that he speaks of in the world. And that brings me to the core of what I want to speak about this morning. Uh, this corruption 
that we are to be released from, or this corruption that we are to escape from. Now the word corruption is talking about a moral decay. It's destruction that takes place from internal, internally. Uh, it's rottenness, uh, perishableness, decay, or decomposition. It speaks of the moral decomposition of our present world. That term world that's used here is the word cosmos. And uh, that word cosmos has the idea of an ordered system. So when that word cosmos is used here, it's talking about all of the ordered systems of our world, our culture. You have your political system, you have your educational system, uh, you have your health systems, and all of the systems that are in place uh, that enable us to function uh, in a cohesive fashion as a, as a culture. And the reality is this, that at the center of all of those systems is a defect or a flaw. And that defect and that flaw is the fact that it is all driven for us, by us, and for our ultimate good. And God is left out of the system. That's the word world. Uh, ordered systems, ordered systems around man, around all that we can do, all that we have, and all that pertains to us, and God is left on the outside. That came into existence in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve said that they wanted to do it their way and not God's way. So God was no longer the center of their relationship, and the societies of the world, the cultures of the world, developed around man and not around God, and that's what's involved in that world. The corruption uh, that is spoken of there is the decay that's taking place as a result of the world focusing entirely on itself and having no place whatsoever for God. Now that word corruption is used in verse 4 of chapter 1. It says uh, that uh, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust, and it's used again in chapter 2, verse 19, where it speaks of being slaves to corruption. But then another word is used in chapter 2, verse 20. It speaks about having escaped the defilements of the world. And that word defilement is different than the word corruption. Corruption speaks about internal decay. But defilement speaks about pollution or spiritual stain. And so what Peter is doing here is he is saying that we are delivered from the moral corruption, the inward corruption of the world, but we are also delivered from the pollution of the world, the stain of the world. You see, the world contaminates spiritually is what Peter is saying. And we are set free from that spiritual contamination. Now everything here centers around the reality that the corruption is in the world by lust, verse 4. That word lust speaks about passionate desire. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 6, we read this, When the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. The key phrase in there, I believe, to understand what was happening, is stated, the tree was desirable. You see, the thing that happened in Eden, with Adam and Eve, is their desires became defiled. In other words, what they wanted, the motivation of their life, the pursuit of their life, became not God, but it became them. They became the center of their lives. And that's what lust is, that passionate desire to have things our way. That word lust comes from a word, uh, uh, epithomia, uh, it means focused upon, with passionate desire. Now the issue is this, that those who are focused on that passionate desire are slaves to it. 
Let's read again chapter 2, verses 17 through 22. These are springs without water, mist driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogance words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires. There's that word again. They entice by fleshly desire, by sensuality. And that word sensuality is a little different from fleshly desire. Sensuality has to do with absolute, absolute horrible corruptness displayed before everyone. By fleshly desire, by sensuality, those who barely escape from those who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. You see, what the world tells us is that they are offering to us freedom. Uh, this is the message that we're being sold today, constantly, over and over and over, to the point of absurdity, to the point where we are supposed to be able to determine our identity. Like, we can be whatever we want to be. Uh, we can be male, we can be female. Uh, it's our choice. It's our choice. Uh, that, my friends, is delusional. Anyone knows that to be a fact. And I don't think we as Christians should apologize for what we're saying. This is common knowledge and it has been throughout history, throughout the history of mankind. There are men and there are women. And it's not determined by what you think. It's determined by how you are born. Period. End of story. And anything that goes beyond that is delusional. And delusional means that it's lost touch with reality and it has lost touch with rational thought and rational discussion. And that's where we're at today. But you see, we're being offered freedom. But the reality is this, that the freedom that is being offered is binding us more and more and more to destruction. That freedom destroys. And if we don't curb that in our culture, if there is not a shift in thinking and direction in our culture, it is going to destroy us. We are going to destroy ourselves from the inside. It is a corruption that is being propagated. It's an inward rot is what it is. And that fruit begins to rot and it spreads until the whole basket has to be thrown out. Now, I know that sounds a little bit harsh, and I don't mean it to be harsh, I mean it to be realistic. We need to say this. We need to say what is true according to the Word of God. You see, the freedom we, be, we are being offered is the freedom that enslaves. It does not set free. Now, Peter says that it is possible to escape, to escape the destruction, the corruption, it's possible to escape the defilements. And that escape, there's only one way. That's what this whole book is all about. <laughs> there's, there's only one way to escape. There's only one door out. Uh, his name is Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And when you turn to Him, He breaks the power of cancelled sin within the human heart. The issue, folks, is not outward in our culture. There are no government decisions that are going to correct this. I believe that we have the only answer to the need that exists in the Gospel. The need is the human heart. The need is called sin, S-I-N. The only issue, the only solution to that issue is found in the Gospel. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It takes a personal decision on the part of 
any individual who is going to escape this corruption, it takes a personal decision to follow Christ, to name Him as Savior, to honor Him as Lord. And I'm saying this, not only say He is my Savior, that's only half the picture. Because He can be your Savior, theoretically, and you can still be enslaved by the corruption of this world. But when He is your Lord, you are set free. When He is your Lord, you are set free. When you come to Him to receive Him as Savior, to bow your knee to Him, He cleanses you from sin and He corrects the defect. He corrects the defect. The defect is the human heart. He corrects the defect of human self-centeredness and He breaks those chains. He sets you free from yourself and He enables you to submit to God and to enjoy Him and to honor Him and to glorify Him, to walk with Him, to be filled with His love and grace and His goodness. He is the only answer, folks. He is the only answer. You see, those who are promising freedom, as Peter says in verse 19, while they themselves are slaves of corruption, need to understand that their freedom has overcome them. And if their freedom overcomes them, they are slaves. That freedom that the world talks about is absolute, utter slavery. The world is not free to do what it wants to do. It thinks it is. But the world is living in slavery and bondage. I think that should call for compassion on the part of us as God's people, not condemnation. I think we should be on our knees before God, constantly for our neighbors, our friends, for our world, our country, province. That God would open the eyes of those who cannot see. That they might see Christ and find in Him the answer, the solution to what they are seeking. I read an interesting story about a North Korean who escaped from an internment camp through a set of friends' sacrifice. I'll just read it to you. In 2005, Shin Dong-uk became the only person to ever escape from a to total control zone internment camp in North Korea, and he lived to tell the tale. Because Shin was born in the prison, he knew no other life. In his mind, the entire world was Camp 14, and there were only two types of people in the world, prisoners and guards. That was his world. You were born one or the other, and you lived your entire life that way. He later said that he never considered escape because he always assumed that the society outside the camp would be similar to that inside the camp. I'm going to stop right there. I can't go any further without drawing the obvious parallel between what I'm trying to tell you about what Christ does in the condition of our world without pointing out that uh, people are in that internment camp. And all they can see is two classes. There's the guards and there's the prisoners. Anyway, every day Shin was told what to do and he did it for 23 years. He was always hungry and he was tired from daily hard labor. But Shin said everything changed one day. A new prisoner named Park was brought to Camp 14 and with him came tales of a different world on the other side of the electric fence. And there's a different world outside of this world system. He talked about living in cities and traveling to China, but one thing, particular thing that Park talked about, defined freedom in Xin Dingyong's mind more than anything else, broiled chicken. Park told him that outside the electric fence of his world was another world where you could eat broiled chicken and you could eat it anytime you wanted. So he equated freedom with broiled chicken. 
Uh, Shin had never eaten chicken, but he knew that chicken, he knew what chicken tasted like without ever, without ever having eaten it. It tasted like freedom. And this quest for broiled chicken led Shin and Park to attempt to escape over the electrified fence. I'm not sure exactly how all this took place. I have a bunch of questions about it, but this is what they say. Park touched the fence first and immediately he died. As untold number of bolts coursed through his body and stopped his heart, his body became a bridge over which Shin was able to climb to freedom. And that day he became the only person to ever escape from a total control zone internment camp in North Korea and lived to tell about it. He's no longer a prisoner. He now lives in South Korea. He eats broiled chicken whenever he wants. His chicken, along with his freedom, was purchased by a friend who gave his life for him. The obvious application of that is we have a friend. We have a friend who made a way out of the internment camp. I don't know where you're at today. You may be a Christian who's living in bondage. I can tell you right now, that is not what God wants for you. You may have these voices in your head saying you're never going to be different. That is a lie. That is coming straight from the pit of hell. The gospel, Jesus, changes everything. He is the answer. Period. End of story, bottom line. That's it. And when you turn to Him, and you submit to Him, uh, if you're not a Christian, if you don't know Christ, if you've never been born again, you need to stop and confess Him as Savior and bow to Him as Lord. When you do that, I can guarantee you that He will transform your life from the inside out and you will become a new creation. You will not even understand yourself Immediately, It's going to take you a long time to process that, but God can do that. And if you're here today as a Christian and you're struggling and you feel that you're living in bondage, you're in a prison, you don't have to be there. Jesus came and died to set you free. I don't care what the issue is. There is no issue that he cannot solve. And I'm not saying that's going to happen immediately. It could very well. It may take 40 years, but I can guarantee you, he will never, never fail. Jesus said to Peter, the Peter who wrote this epistle, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that rock, I believe, is Christ. Let's pray. I don't do this very often, but if you keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed, there may be someone here today who wants to turn to Christ. You want to be become a Christian. You don't think that you are. Uh, you've got so many questions. Uh, I would love to pray with you. I won't make a public display of it, although confession of faith needs to be public. But if you want to receive Christ as your Savior, just indicate by raising your hand this morning. I'll give you just a few minutes to do that. Secondly, I'd say this, that if there's someone here who is a believer and you're struggling, you feel like you're living in bondage and you need to be set free from that, Whatever that issue might be, I'd love to pray with you. I believe God wants to set you free. And He can do that. He can do that today. If you want to do that, just signify by raising your hand. And just in case I didn't notice, uh, if you tried to raise your hand or you were hesitant, I'll be up the front after the service, and if you want to talk to me, feel free to do that. Thank you, Father, today for your word. Thank you for your grace, for your love, your mercy. Thank you for our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.